I'm Mary Ann Zarzana, the author's wife, and I'd like to introduce him. James A. Zarzana holds a BA in English from St. Mary's College of California and an MA in English from Sacramento State University. He earned his PhD at the University of Notre Dame, specializing in the British novel. Zarzana is a professor emeritus and former department chair of Southwest Minnesota State University, which he joined in 1989. He is the 24 recipient of the prestigious Kathy Cowan Award for teaching and service to the community in uh, Marshall, Minnesota. Most of Zarzana's work is speculative fiction, but he's currently working on a comedic novel set in academia. In addition to the Marsco saga, Zarzana is also working on a science fiction series focusing on mutinous factions within an interstellar empire. Married to professor and poet Mary Ann Zarzana, that's me. Uh, we have one daughter, Elaine, who has graduated um, from Notre Dame and SMSU. I give you um, James A. Zarzana. Thank you. Hi, uh, and welcome. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Paula. Where'd Paula go? There's Paula. And everyone at the library here uh, for hosting this. This is my launching a book two date, I promised Paula and the library. Well, actually, Holly is who I promised, you know, who is now gone, uh, which is fine. But um, I, I said, you know, when book two comes out, I want to launch it here. I, I, I really, we, uh, Marianne and I both really like uh, and love the Marshall community. We've been here almost 27 years. Uh, I was the guy the day we showed up, got out of the car and told Marianne, don't worry, three years from now, we'll be out of here. And uh, we're still here. Uh, and still loving it. And I know Jim remembers Elaine when she was a senior, uh, so what, 12 or 13 years ago, spoke at Rotary and she began her talk by saying, I can't wait to get out of Marshall. And everyone burst out laughing. They said, no, no, that's what my friends say, but I really like Marshall. So we do love the Marshall community. It's a beautiful library. Uh, I think it's a symbol of, of community involvement, this library. And, and we're, we're very, very, <coughs> very, very fortunate to have it. I also want to do a quick shout out to uh, Kathy Bernardi Jones, who is a graduate of our department from many years ago. I probably shouldn't give you her exact graduation date. Uh, you could figure out her age. Uh, but she has a uh, uh, business, and she is the uh, uh, copy editor of both books. Uh, she's worked very, very hard. Let me tell you, hell hath no fury like a copy editor when you, you don't follow her advice or when you write something blatantly stupid. Uh, I was very pleased uh, most of the way through the book. Uh, I had Tessa, as you most of you know, is one of the main characters, say something, and oh boy, did I get a blast. Ah, she would never say that. Yeah, what are you talking about? So, because she was kind of, kind of, uh, you know, playing really diminutive and kind of shrinking violence. Are you kidding me? She's been, so I had to fix that passage. So anyway, she's been very, very so more than just copy editing, she really understands the characters. Of course, Mary Ann uh, and Elaine, Elaine, our daughter who can't be here, who's teaching in Sweden, by the way, um, teaching English, uh, so for all their support. As I often say of Mary Ann, and I'm, and I'm very happy to say this, she has never once stood behind me while I've been at the computer writing and said, you know, if you didn't write all those damn books, you could paint the bathroom. You know, I mean, it's just wonderful. You need, the, the bathroom's been painted. Okay, we, we, we hired a guy. But, um, you know, you, you need space to write. As I, as I often tell people, is, uh, writing is like uh, uh, training a dog. I mean, let's face it. The first thing you teach a dog is sit, stay, right? Sit, stay. And, you know, if you, if you aren't going to sit and stay, you aren't going to write. You know, there's no, there's no getting around it. And you can't have somebody jerking the leash, you know, so. Marianne's been very, very cooperative. And I also want to give a shout out to others who read book one. Some of you are in this room, sent me a little emails. When's book two coming out? Uh, book two got delayed, lots of reasons why it got delayed. Um, first of all, just to not to defend myself, but they're long books. Uh, Kathy Bernardi Jones, I said, you know, maybe they're too long. And she goes, no, my husband read it. He gets two books a month from two different sci-fi clubs. They're all big and thick. And she calls them nose breakers because, you know, you're reading in bed and you're reading and you fall asleep and it falls and breaks your nose. And she said, no, it's not too long. But they're long. And, but they read well. Don't worry. They read well. <laughs> there's no fluff. And uh, it just takes a long time to edit that. Uh, you know, there's no 
I wish my freshman writing students would get that on a 500 word essay that you have to look at every word several times and when you get a long text like that. So thank you for encouraging me after uh, book one to keep going. Uh, book three, actually this morning I was working on book three. <laughs> You'll be happy to know I have five different intro chapters to book three. That shows you the kind of conditions it's in. Uh, I'm thinking end of the summer or beginning or sometime in the autumn of 17 now, not 16, so a year from now. But book three is in the editing stages. Uh, so that first chapter I was working on is not, none of the other chapters are written. The chapters are written, but um, so I need to, uh, I just need to edit it, but I'm not quite sure where I want to start, so I keep changing things. So. But I think I'm on to it. I think I got it. Anyway, uh, if you haven't read book one, I'm almost tempted as an English professor, because that's what I was for many, many years, is to send you out of the classroom and make you read the book in the hallway, because I'm only going to read from book two. So if you haven't read book one, I'll try to give you some background, or if it's been a while since you read it and you forgot who some of the characters are and some of the uh, background information. And as you notice, we do have a few copies to sell afterwards, and I'll be glad to uh, sign copies and sell copies uh, afterwards. Okay. So, uh, uh, first things first, I want to read a little passage uh, with Zot. Now, <clears throat> Zot's a main character, uh, Anthony Grisotti. Uh, he's uh, uh, a hiberman or a hibernation specialist, and actually, he's like one of the most advanced in the Marsco world. Marsco controls the Earth, it's a gigantic super corporation. Through hook or by crook, it's taken over the world. And you only survive in this world if you're associated with Marsco. There are some independent people, uh, called independents, uh, who can kind of survive. And there's going to be a passage with an independent spaceship uh, toward the end if I get time to do that one. And then, uh, but Zot's fed up. Uh, he's had a couple incidents at the end of book one, if you've read book one. Uh, and at the book, uh, beginning of book two, uh, uh, to give a shout out to Sacramento State where I did my master's. It's actually set at Sac State, uh, the future Sac State. It's no longer a university and it's, it's kind of a grisly scene. Ends up with somebody being killed and Zotz just had it. That's it. That's the last, you know, Tessa's broken up with him. He's been in love with Tessa for years and he's, that's it. I'm getting out of Marsco and he just like, uh, one of these, <laughs> it's usually a guy, okay? Uh, it's usually an Italian-American guy. He just says, ah, I'm going to do this. And he just makes another mistake and another mistake and another mistake. So that's most of the book in a nutshell. Uh, anyway, uh, so if you don't know about the books, I need my little. On the cover of book one, you see the hand and you see the little finger implants. Those are called finger discs. Now this person has a red one which makes them very important because the red is like a military, military command and control, control disc. Uh, but most people they're blue, blue-green. And uh, Marsco allows you to get those implants and that's how you run computers. And there are a few exceptions of people that can put a thimble on that does the same thing and run a few computers. But I mean if you're really important in Marsco, you have these finger discs and you start with your right hand and you fill them up and they can be in several places on your hand because you just sometimes just need to tap the computer to get it going and then you, you, know, you do whatever you're going to do. Uh, and if you're really important, they start putting them on your left hand. Then you're a lefter and then you're really important. Uh, probably nobody is a lefter who isn't in Marsco. So Zot's going to have some of his discs desensitized because he's leaving Marsco, but he's got all his training to run all of this sophisticated uh, hibernation because when they go out to the Marsco goes out as far as the asteroid belt. There's colonies on the astro be asteroid belt on Mars on the moon. They're almost all Marsco colonies. There's a few independents. Uh, and Zod actually went all the way to Jupiter with an experimental ship uh, and at that time he developed a real cryogenic stasis uh, system, whereas hibernation you sleep for six months. Cryogenic stasis you can be asleep for two years, two, uh, 200 years or 250 years. So that's kind of uh, what, what he's done. But now he's done with it, out of it. He just wants to be out. So he's going, I have to change reading glasses. I can't see any of you now, so if you leave I wouldn't know. Um, so Zot's going to get these and he has to go to this 
uh, part of Marsco. It's actually in San Francisco. I see you got a San Francisco shirt. Uh, and uh, uh, he's, he's there. Uh, he's come over from Sacramento, Sac City in the book. Uh, and he's going to record updates and verifications. Records, updates, and verifications was a maze spreading throughout the whole floor. It's a floor of a high rise. In each of these identical cubicles, the Iceman thought, shrugging, you're as alone here as in deep space while the crew hibers. Such was this solar system of scores of functional insepid associates. As Zot made his way through the twists and turns to reach the decommissioning workstation, he got lost. It was easier to find the right link on a Marsco screen than it was to find the right associate in this Warren. Although each cubicle had an associate, no one here had any real rank or status. Even as Grisati moved closer to finding his waiting drone, you know, the guy that was gonna do this, he walked with his chest out and shoulders back. He was an academy grad, after all. He served in the Marsco Asteroid Service. While well, these supplicating peons had vied for a slightly bigger cubicle with a functionally wider skyline view, he had watched Earth rise from the moon, witnessed Mars during a swing by, studied Jupiter's stormy red spot swirling outside the Gagarin's viewport. His career, a career he justifiably took pride in. Finally sitting at the correct noise dampering box, Zot was disappointed that the mere two-disker handling his resignation never gave him an opportunity to explain why he was taking such an extraordinary step. It wasn't an, easy, it wasn't an exit interview. It was strictly a procedure desensitizing some of his disk functionality. The drone needn't wear a uniform, but he was formally dressed, as was every other associate in the Warren. He wore a cerulean blue collared shirt of regulation cut. Hung on a hook to the left was a navy blazer with a, the Marsco emblem on its pocket. Both the eastern and western hemispheres of Earth were stylized in two adjoining circles like an infinity symbol. Each significant sector was marked with a red star, Silicon, Seattle, the largest, Kuala Lumpur, Rome, Bombay, Shanghai. The associate was out without any real identity, though this one raged silently via a single earring and a curling pug dog tail at the back of his head that just touched his shirt collar. The Iceman's beard and the drone's braid, quiet protests against Marsco's conformity. Zot had to give the Pratt that. Decommissioning itself was a short procedure. The efficient, humorless drudge merely needed to twitch up Zot's personnel file. A few disk movements confirmed his identity. The staffer verified his length of service. All that time and space and so little icing was his only smarmy comment under his breath, as if to imply another parasite sucking back bonus Marsco units while the crews ice down. When the command crew of a shuttle was in hibernation, an Iceman received a temporary pay boost rating as acting captain of the ship. Zot said nothing. He was beyond explaining why he was an officer and an Iceman and why the sub subsequent pay increase still existed at all. The whole process was finished in less than 10 minutes. That easy, Zot asked, what? Getting out? Harder getting in than out, the associate remarked with no emotion. I do this so rarely, mostly I boot up newly created files or examine existing ones for irregularities. You mean to suggest, the Iceman feigned incredulity, that someone can crack Marsco's system? No, but cyber, files still, uh, but cyber life still is garbage in, garbage out. I'm sort of an info ferret, actually. You named it. The Marsco officer looked blankly at the rodent. Will you remove any disks? No need. You aren't a lefter. No command and control disk. Nothing red on you. Three disks initialized, that's all. Reinitialized, desensitized to lower access capability. The drudge explained that the Iceman still had full ass, ass, uh, access to much of the Marsco net. 
then nothing's changed for you professionally. Any hybrid community uh, computer will work for you. The rodent glared to suggest another indie peckerwood making lander loads of money off Marsco training. Zot swiftly went from being an officer in Marsco to being a well-disked and well-paid SID. That's it, the associate explained, setting down his glowing desensitizer probe. You've been millered. Zot didn't understand the remark. The uh, partition denizen explained, you have been in space a long time. Anyone leaving up here, we just call him a miller. You've been millered. Tessa Miller? No, I don't know her. Was referring to that gnarly crank Walter Miller. But he's still an associate, the Iceman defended his mentor. I don't know if he is or not. Uh, he let the comparison drop. But you're now a miller. He looked at him as if to stare a deep, share a deep secret about the once respected associate. After all, his postings end up everywhere. He fancies himself the voice of reason, speaking for Marsco, our lost conscience. He's a nuisance. You access a screen, something secure, and, uh, and his latest spams up, screaming into your desktop. You can't get rid of it, like a sea powers virus. He's cunning in the way his, he posts his manifestos, his tirades. You're positive he posts them all, especially those diatribes? The drone stared blankly at the Iceman, as though, they were currently, uh, as though he were currently uttering gibberish. I mean, Zot continues, who knows for sure just who was author of anything on the net? It was a point that had never occurred to the trusting associate whose job it was to make sure no one made a file that wasn't fully sanctioned. Also, what makes you think I share any of his views? The Iceman asked suspiciously. Just what does Marsco know about the inner me anyway? We know nothing of you per se, the drudge dismissed the Hyberman's allegations. And actually, some of Miller's remarks aren't, now don't get me wrong, anything lud, uh, anything violent. We're, us up here that do these rare decommissioning process, he circled his right hand to mean those and a half a dozen surrounding cubicles. We just call you egressing types Millers, that's all. And they want out, they want their discs, sort of cake and. He, uh, they are few and far between. Zot took the jab as a sign of honor. So, you're out. Let me just double check. We do this so seldom. He reiterated while twitching through a half a dozen final screens. Yep, that's it. Effective just nanos after 2400 tonight. The system needs a circadian for your access deniability status to go online that you're offline. Partially, if you catch. Zot smiled as he thought uh, as he thought at what he thought was dry, wry humor, then added, if there's anything you want to search, uh, research sensitive-wise, in a restricted file, you have about 12 and a half hours. Any personnel biofacts you'd like to peek that's accessible now and your ongoing status, any, uh, access them now because then you're off. That applies, of course, only to restricted sites. You'll be denied in 12 hours. Generally, you're still as active as ever, and you realize the unit will know, should you try, when you're attempting to enter a secure file. Yes, I realize that. After Circadium, I wouldn't ping any domains you're, you know are black. That program will, full, will be full deny. Plus, it'll know who you are. Uh, uh, he gently lifted Zot's right hand, showing the palm side up. These haven't really changed. It'll know who you are and, more importantly, where you are. The intel wing of security and hygiene does more than bust up prims. With that unceremonious flourish, the deep space officer left the cubicle, his resignation accepted. Zot took an elevator down to the 23rd floor to an open set of community consoles that the tech, rich, that the tech directed him to. Before accessing an open unit, he bought some time. Half a dozen associates and three SID managers were scattered around the banks of 25 con consoles. He headed for a corner, hoping for some privacy. The soon-to-exit associate was initially anxious about placing his hand over a disk ID pad in case his DMOB info had reached the main memory file early. 
a nano before he put his prime disc there. He straightened his chair, withdrew his e-notepad, a stylus from his pocket, all those nervous antics used to delay the inevitable. Finally, Zot placed his hand over the ID pad. It accepted him as usual. All was still no normal. The computer had no way of knowing as yet that many of the classified files he wanted to examine would be denied to him in 12 hours. Okay, I'm going to just end it right there. Uh, it's a little technical, and the book is really not so much sci-fi you can't read it. I've had people tell me uh, that they usually don't like sci-fi, uh, and they, uh, but they like this book because it's really economic sci-fi. Uh, there were some terms in there I guess I should have explained. Uh, prim is the lowest, I mean most of us would be prims. We'd be forced out of the technical world. Uh, we would be good for only physical labor uh, and not really allowed to have a life. SIDS are uh, members of a subsidiary and they would be like the upper middle class that Marsco allows to, um, to uh, exist because they need somebody to grow the food and sell the food and run some things. But by and large, you're either an associate. Uh, it's kind of the 1%, not to put too much current political talk uh, into it, but uh, there you have it. So Zot uh, is, is full of it, this internal tension, and when you read book two, you'll see how that works out. So another main character from book one uh, is Fuentes, Julio Fuentes. Now, uh, Julio... Uh, is part of it, if you've read book one, you know he's part of a plot. Uh, unknowing to him, he's been uh, conditioned, uh, let me say brainwashed, but it, it's done more technically than that. Uh, and, and now he's under the control of this uh, madman, guy's completely nuts, bonkers, uh, Hawkins. And Hawkins fancies himself the liberator of the earth by, get this, restarting a war that had been fought 25 years ago he has secreted atomic weapons to an asteroid base. He has crews up there who are in suspended animation, and he's bringing this fleet back to the Earth uh, to, to blow the Earth with atomic weapons so that he could win the war. I mean, he's just nuts. Uh, uh, actually, an interesting character, but nuts. You know? uh, anyway, Fuentes is under his thumb. Now, uh, part of Hawkins' plan is he needs an army on Earth. Uh, and so he's decided uh, that he is going to uh, make uh, an alliance with this prim religious radical group that are just rabid. Uh, and so you've got these two groups that are kind of off their whack. Um, and the Luddites, the Nexus is what they're called, uh, have mixed religious fervor. Uh, you know, he's quoting the Bible, misquoting the Bible, and they, you know, we're going to do retribution and you know, slaughter the children. There's an old biblical line: slaughter the children to punish the parents, or something like. Whoa, and that's kind of their mantra. They just want to destroy everything, Marsco. So these two groups are uh, hooking up. It would kind of be like if ISIS and one of these Aryan Brotherhood groups that would like take over Oregon, you know, federal property, suddenly decided to link up and destroy the world. I mean, that's how extreme these two groups are. And so here's Fuentes, under mind control by uh, Hawkins, and, and you'll see what, what happens to him. So they're at the Nexus base, it's in the jungles of the Amazon. Uh, it was formerly a Brazilian military compound. Brazil falls apart. Every country falls apart. That's how. So they're in this underground bunker system. Uh, and I think that's pretty much uh, as much. There's going to be leader. He's the Nexus leader. Hawkins, uh, Fuentes. Haw uh, uh, the leader has Kip, who's actually Indian, but he's in South America acting as a lieutenant to leader. Uh, and then soon they're going to be joined by Mother, uh, who's uh, the kind of the spiritual advisor and uh, just as bloodthirsty member of the, the Nexus. So when, when it says the four entered this chamber, that's Kip, Leader, Hawkins, and Fuentes. The four entered a large chamber that had a sandy floor and a row of eight posts in front of the wall at the far end. 25 meters distance. I should remind you, uh, the Nexus don't want anything to do with technology. So if you have a finger disc or if you want anything to do with it, they're against it. They want to destroy all technology. Uh, so they're Luddites. 
uh, but they're willing to go along with Hawkins because he's going to bring them some weapons. But, you know, they kill people with spears, stuff like that. Their straw targets, each the size and shape of a man, were attached to half the post for a soggy training and uh, what seemed to be the primary weapon of the jungle warriors. The chamber was long and wide, but with a vaulted ceiling and a bright, bright walls. Its southern walls was a cliff face of the valley. It was the only side that let in any natural light. Their walk through the connected tunnels brought them downward to the chamber that faced the valley floor, well away from the huts. Sunlight came through the long row of openings in the exposed wall, giving a bright, airy feel to an otherwise cheerless chamber. The majority of the large chamber was hewn into the ridges rising above the exposed wall. Nothing was done to decorate the walls or to hide the blood stains. Hawkins and Fuentes watched as four followers dragged out two bound associates from cells buried beneath their feet. One of those, in one of his rare boasts, Kip informed leaders' guests, these are being unfortunate troopers, the only two left alive, once manning a post six kilometers from our valley. Just outside your electronic umbrella, Hawkins interjected to demonstrate how much he knew of their secretive electronic ways. Just so, these two assumed they were approaching us unknown, but all the while we were watching them set up base camp. Never assume anything in a hot zone, Fuentes confided, his remark catching Hawkins off guard. From a secure camp base deep in the rainforest, security had sent three four trooper teams to recce the mysterious lead site. Instead, Kip and his jungle warriors silently fell on each team in turn. Each LUD approached, uh, then the LUDs approached the main surveillance camp and found these two operatives, taking them alive. The associates had been prisoners for three months. Mothers questioned them repeatedly, the leader stated, with a glance to the witch who had inexplic inexplicably appeared at their side. Under her drug-induced guidance, they, provided, they proved to be extremely helpful. At present, everything the Nexus needed to know from them, they knew. The Shaw woman had seen to that. They're good for only one remaining purpose, the wizen woman gloated. Fuentes watched the pair uh, on Kip's orders, as the pair on Kip's orders were tied up to two posts at the far end of the chamber. The first prisoner was a young man, not much more than a boy, with ruddy hair and freckled arms. His handsome and frank face sprouted a few beard, a fair beard and several open sores. His countenance showed signs of weakness, and he knew instinctively that his end had come. The other older one, hardened by garrison duty, remained in a drug stupor. His leathery skin of similar hue of Kip's contrasted with the callow use feature and reflected the universality of Marsco's race blindness. The younger one was of prim, prim background. His left hand scar attested to that. Everyone, and someone apt to volunteer for a dangerous mission to speed up promotions along. A typical tactic, tactic for a gung-ho legionnaire. The second one was an associ of associate background about as old as Fuentes. While hibernation had kept the pirate pilot looking youthful, duty and torture had aged the captive. But even in his bruised and beaten face, Fuentes saw something vaguely familiar. Kip, leader uttered his only command. With a nod of acknowledgement, the warrior commenced. He withdrew a sharpened thrusting spear from a rack at the side and with a determined pace approached the prisoners. It's not a shiv, Fuentes noted. Kip's weapon was highly decorated and venerated, not a crude handmade blade a security trooper might encounter in a zone. Walking steadily the bound, uh, toward the bound pair, the attacker selected his target. Without moving his eyes from his prey, the grim executioner strode steadily toward the younger one. The prisoner's stringy hair fell across his forehead, but being tethered, he was unable to brush it aside. When he jerked his head to watch Kip keenly, his blue eyes showed as much fierce determination to live as Kip's brown eyes shown and showed an intense desire to kill. As death approached, the doom associate remained braced and motionless for one last action. His breath quieted, his muscles tense, tense but poised, 
the warrior stepped closer, spear extended, probing the air. With his final step, he was ready for a single deadly thrust. The now alert trooper, even with his arms awkwardly pinioned tightly behind, gave an unexpected and strong kick at the menacing Asagi. Both feet sprang upwards, bringing his body parallel to the floor, a meter and a half above the sand, but his tether was short. A loud crack followed. In a fruitless attempt to live a second longer, the unanticipated powerful move snapped the prisoner's right arm. He landed in pain after pointlessly kicking at his executioner's steel. His feet had cut through the air to no effect. His ribs gasped, yet he showed no fear. Gulping for breath, oblivious to his broken arm, he jerked and twisted at the post, refusing to stand there defenselessly, vulnerable, waiting for the inevitable. With one thrust of his shaft, Kip sliced through the prey's torso, aiming for a swift, life-ending puncture of the heart. Rib bones deflected the killing plunge, so the executioner needed to repeat and ram home a steel-tipped weapon a second time, then a third time. All the while, his wounded and tied up prey jerked side to side, avoiding the final killing thrust. Each time the attacker pulled out the, sphere, the spear, blood ran. Each time the associate winced but refused to cry out. He gasped, each breath shorter, shallower, pain filled his face, yet he muffled any scream of terror or panic. One more thrust, one more jinking dodge. Another wounding stab, tears welled, rolled down his young cheeks but he stared down death with tungsten hardened grit that even uh, Hawkins admired. As it became apparent that the prisoner wasn't dying from a quick decisive blow, Kip's sure cool composure <coughs> dissolved. The warrior rammed the razor honed spearhead into the helpless flesh an eighth, then a ninth time. After each thrust, he leaned his entire weight against the decorated shaft, attempting to drive the tip out through the silent, agonizing man's back. The associate's blood soaked the sand, splattered Kip's homespun, spotted his turban. M Kip, mother called only once. The warrior ceased at last, the captive obviously dead, the final thrust uh, useless. The butchered prisoner had remained silent the whole time of Kip's attack. The red wave, a wet red wave ran down his limp body, the final breath escaped, his head lean and twisted sideways on an impossible looking angle because of the broken arm behind. One eye was closed, but the other remained open. Mother stood silently next to leader. Neither, leader. Neither reacted. For them, this kind of retribution had become too routine, too commonplace for an emotional response to save our children. This is how we deal with Marsco, the leader acknowledged thoughtfully, flicking the flies from his white homespun. This is our justice, mother stated with no feeling, to protect our young from its reach. And this righteousness, the Holy One looked at Hawkins, is merely the beginning, once, the beginning once I give my ultimate command. During the frustrating attack on the defenseless prisoner, Fuentes had winced, the only witness to do so. He'd forgotten that a body contained that much blood. The contorted co corpse streaked red remained upright because of its hands tied behind, but hung to one side of the post. It looked terrifyingly curious. The body stared steadily at the former associate with its one open incriminating eye. Blood dripped onto the sandy floor, making a black shimmering puddle where flies by the dozen collected. The second prisoner, a lefter, commanded the recce before captured. When Kip's frustrating action splattered him with blood, he came out of a stupor as if splashed with water. The residue of mother's drugs kept him docile throughout most of this ordeal. His companion's blood broke his listlessness. listlessness. He struggled vainly to free himself even as Kip further agitated him by using his tattered uniform to wipe the spear blade clean. Hawkins remarked an impressive act, leader, a worthy sign of your intentions and your soldier's commitment, but we've come bearing gifts. With these, you can command, you can bring our mutual enemy to its knees. Turning to Fuentes, the, the colonel remarked, take him down, Fuentes. Awkwardly, in deference to leader and mother, Hugo, Julio withdrew his nine millimeter Enfield, twitching its systems alive. 
He calmly leveled the weapon at the prisoner. The hissing propellant alerted the remaining target. Stretching from his post, the lefter moved his head side to side, speaking only one word time and again. He weakened, his weakened condition made the word unintelligible at first, but finally his voice echoed throughout the cave, carved out chamber. Fuentes! The security officer froze. He lowered his aim. Fuentes, the doomed man whispered, it's me, Kurji. The man's staccato voice betrayed his origin. Clearly, he was from Asia. It's me, Kurji Singh, from the academy, remember? You must remember. We were together afterwards as well, three, four years, but then you went off to flight. Kurji's former colleague seemed perplexed as though an IR visor was giving him distorted visuals during a nighttime firefight. When near Hawkins, the associate's mind was full of the commander's voice. He never resisted instructions. This scene, scene produced reluctance and confusion. Growing louder, the captive's voice shattered the spell Hawkins had cast over the one-time associate. Fuentes pleaded the prisoner, sweat running down his brown face, his bare, lean chest. Don't kill an old bud. Officers forever. Fuentes, shouted Hawkins. Remember Julio, the doomed prisoner went on, how we'd talk about improving Marsco, upgrading it, those years together. We'd talk. You've got to remember. Said, it, we, uh, said that it took uh, us all to heart. Band of brothers, you said. I taught you. Marsco is our mother and our father. Remember, treated us all the same, respected us. The pilot grew confused, as, the, as, as confused as delirious Zot two days before, standing there, caught in a conflict of emotions, memories, and others. He didn't know which way to turn. Standing still, the chamber seemed to spin around him. I stayed on with security when you went on to flight. Remember, you must remember. I explain, I'll give security my all, so those coming after us, remember our little brothers, our kids, they won't have to. Remember how we imagined a new Marsco world? Fuentes, the commander shouted a second time, so they wouldn't have to do this duty that we had to do. It's grunt work, pacifying hot zones. You thought me so Mars Marsco for that. Do as you're ordered. Fuentes, Fuentes, Julio, a comrade, a fellow, band of brothers, a better wor world for our fans, for others who follow. A single Enfield blast ended the plaintive reminiscence. The laser designated indicated detonation at precisely the right nanosecond for maximum effect. Unlike the slow death Kip delivered, this was instantaneous. The target's forehead was blown away in a single exploding shell. Flesh and skull smoldered against the wall behind. As the concussion of the discharge and explosion ceased reverberating off the stone walls, the two bodies hung from their posts. The first head leaned to the side. The second, for all practical purposes, was faceless, a bloody mash of flesh hardly recognizable as once human. And Enfield, commented the leader, commented the leader a fell weapon indeed. He took Fuente's sidearm gently in his hands, holding it like a sacred object long missing from an acolyte's monastery. The terror of our godless enemy, once issued to so many of my prims in that dark hour of Marsco triumph, our stolen victory. Yours again, O oh leader, whispered Hawkins at his side. More besides, he assured him, an ample time to stockpile and train. We'll help you. See to your needs. But discs, those implanted poisons, we have none. He held up his right hand, palm outward. Hawkins momentarily thought the leader's fingertips showed disc removal scars. We dare not wear death, Mother added, spitting with emphasis. Our gift won't need them. More besides, questioned the leader as they left the chamber. A ceaseless supply, explained Hawkins, pleased with this turn of events. Fully fireable without discs. Only Kip and Mother remain behind in the death chamber. Before ordering the bodies disposed of, Mother untied their hands. With a short knife, she roughly sliced off all the disc fingers as though disjointing chicken. 
Mother's a piece of work. Uh, yeah, so uh, she loves to, uh, when they kill associates, cut the fingers off that have the finger discs and, and go on from there. So um, I, I have a longer passage, but I, uh, I had four picked out. I'm only going to read three, but I really can't um, jump into it. I want to do a Q&A. Why don't we do a Q&A, and then if, if you want a little more, if I have time, I can do a little more read. But I can't do a Q&A until I change glasses because I, I can't see it. Um, I hope that gives you a taste of what's going on. It is a violent book. Um, uh, there, there are a few love scenes, but it's not a bodice ripper type love scenes. Uh, but it is a, um, uh, like I say, political science fiction. I'm, I'm more interested in uh, the politics of a world dominated where power is the sole political entity and you know, those people that wield the power. Uh, and so there's no elections, there's no education. And uh, it's kind of a, a dark look at the future. I am working on book three. Uh, which is called the Marsco uh, Sustainability Project. Uh, and uh, it's set 50 years at the end of book two. Uh, and it's, it, I think, ends a little, a little bit more hopeful. Uh, the book is done. It just needs to be edited. Uh, although I've got to figure out chapter one because I have five chapter ones at the moment. Um, and uh, book four is written, uh, which is called uh, The Ascendancy of Marsco. It's a prequel. Uh, and for those of you that have read uh, book one, I won't ask for a show of hands, but uh, uh, Miller, Walter Miller, one of the main characters throughout book one is writing the history of how Marsco came into being. And that book he calls The Ascendancy of Marsco. And so I quickly realized as I was writing book one and book two that I needed to write that book. Uh, and so uh, that's book four. And it's uh, these are very traditional third-person narrative voice. They read like Harry Potter. They read like uh, Jane Austen in that you third-person, uh, not to sound like an English professor, but third-person is that voice that's exterior of the narrative. So you have he said, she said, they did this, not I said this, and then I noticed this, you know, which is first-person. And the, the fourth book is actually has like 14 or 16 narrators telling various parts of the story because no one really knows the whole story. So I have uh, people being recruited to, to fight against Marsco. I have this uh, one, uh, I, I'm actually working on it to enter it in a short story co contest called The Content Provider. And she's a propagandist, you know, kind of up there and, and on what would be television in the future and, you know, uh, being manipulated and she kind of figures things out. Anyway, uh, Miller talks, so it, it's all about the rise of, of Marsco and how it comes to power and the big war and, yeah, that brings it to power. So anyway, they're going to be there. They're all going to get done. I've committed myself to doing all of them. So anyway, any questions or um, observations or? I have a question. Yeah, sure. Does the title indicate in book two that Marsco does try? Because right now it's sketchy. I'm halfway through. <laughs> okay. Well, good. I'm glad there's tension. You know what Dickens said? Make them laugh, make them cry, make them wait. So uh, they're, they're, yeah. Um, yeah, get to the end and then we'll talk about it. <laughs> you know, you can win and lose. You know, I'll leave it at that. It's a great ending. It, it's a great ending. And, and I did have a reader email me already that read it and said a lot of twists there at the end. And I emailed him back and said, well, what are you specifically re referring to? But he, would, he wouldn't tell me. <laughs> so, but he liked the twists at the end. So. But thank you for your question. Yeah? Talk about the difference between writing the first one, the process, and writing the second one. You mean book one and two? Well, um, easier, harder. Yeah. Book two, well, I'll tell you the whole story, okay? You got an hour? So I was going to have a sabbatical way back in the spring of 1997. Uh, I was uh, granted a sabbatical for the fall semester. I was going to have one semester off. And I decided that I would try to write a book, one book, uh, that I would be done by December, just before I had to start teaching again that the publisher would snap it up, that it would become instantly a huge success, and I'd retire at 40, whatever I was, from full-time teaching into full-time writing because I'd have this successful book. So that's the, the story of my overnight success. 
well, this is 2016, so 19 years later. So as I'm writing book one, uh, I'm getting to the end of book one, and I go, well, I haven't finished the story. Those of you that read book one, it's kind of a cliffhanger. Uh, it's not really a cliffhanger um, in that the woman's not on the railroad track and the train's coming, you've got to wait till next week. But it's kind of a cliffhanger. Uh, and then book two brings more closure to that story. So it wasn't that hard to write book two. Uh, then I started um, book three, which I, is the, the um, Ascendancy of Marsco. So really what's going to be in print, book four, was the third one I wrote. And then when I started to write, and I thought, well, I, I'm just, you know, I'm an English professor. I know about all these different styles of writing, and I teach it. And I'm just going to have fun. I'm going to kick back. I'm just going to, and I said, okay, I'm going to give myself 100 pages, and I'll start writing this in all these different formats. And if I like it, I'll keep going. If not, I'll go back and write it in third person. Well, it just took off. I mean, I really enjoyed it. It, it just gives you a lot of freedom. It's a bugger to edit, right? Tom's edited one chapter for a short story contest and you don't know whether I made a mistake or the, got the speaker who's, who's not particularly well educated, his grammar was supposed to be that bad or, you know, and it's just, it, you know, and you got to keep it up, you know. It's easier to write grammatically because you know the rules, but you create a character that's breaking all the rules. Oh, God, what, when did he say that? Anyway, um, so I wrote that one. Then uh, just the summer before I was going to be chair, I knew I needed to write a third well, fourth book, it's going to be the third book. And so I said, that's it. I got a summer to write this book. I had 13 weeks, maybe 12 weeks, and I did it. I sat down and did it. And I haven't really looked at it since then. I'm really dying to get into it. So the, the books haven't been hard to write. The, the, the hard thing to write is going from the first, to, actually, it's about the fifth draft because I'm always reading the chapters and playing with it and everything. But when, when you really go to form it into a book, that's the hard work. That's, that's, the, that's the hard work. One of my main characters in book three, in a single chapter in a single afternoon, is 18, 20, and 22. As I was writing it, I couldn't make up my mind how old I wanted her. So that's the kind of stuff you can do in a draft, because you know you're going to fix it. When I sit down and work on that chapter, I gotta, it's got to be done, you know, and then you move on from there. And then the editing is a long, a long process. Yes, sir. Um, when you write something well in advance, decade, really, yeah. kind of some uh, release, yeah. this is science fiction, and science catches up with I know. science fiction. I you have to do a lot of rewriting oh, to make it uh, uh, congruent with the current. Uh, uh, yeah, I, a little TO'd about that. that I guess, uh, you know, a part of the hook that, that Miller Sr. and Tessa, their father and daughter, are designing this ion engine. And uh, you know, NASA has one that's better than the one that they're talking about. The only thing I get around is I keep saying things like, well, Marsco just doesn't let pe people tink in their garage and change things. They want to control everything. And so they don't let people do that. And then I just brush over it. But yeah, there's, but you know, the implants, people are doing that. They're doing implants. And I got really ticked at one, at one of the Republicans uh, he's no longer running for president. But he suggested that just like um, uh, uh, UPS and all these uh, shipping companies track their packages with, a, with an RFID, well, I, that's what a prim wears. A prim has a disc inserted under the skin of their left hand, and, and that's how Marsco knows where they are. And that's like 95% of the population, you know, so they're tracking everybody. And I thought, that's a copyrighted idea, bugger. If you want people to actually, he wanted to do it with illegal immigrants. So you're illegal, you're here illegally anyway. How are you going to, but then you wanted, the, you know, UPS to track them. And I thought, that's my idea. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of things like that. And, and uh, you know, the, the Enfield is a, you know, yeah, just a super gun. And so yeah, things catch up. But it's sci-fi. People just have to take a breath and say, ah, it could happen. Yeah. When you first uh, back in what, 1997 or yeah. something, was Marsco, was that your idea back then, or did that change? Uh, no, it's, the first book was called Marsco, and I always knew Marsco was this sinister. Uh, the first chapter I wrote actually was with um, uh, Fuentes uh, on a shuttle with Hawkins, uh, and then um, 
Fuentes was in love with the, uh, the pilot. At first, very sexist, Fuentes was going to be the pilot and the woman was going to be the co-pilot. Then after a while I thought, nah, let's switch this. So I made her in command because he had gotten out of the academy and then had to go into security. You know, the Marsco world needs officers to go and do this grunt work, you know, and, and, and so men mainly, but a lot of the officers graduate and then they have to go into like the military arm and he did that for five years, but then they allowed him to go into back to flight. He was trained to be a pilot. Uh, and that's what the, the, the scene they're talking about. Whereas uh, the, the, the woman had gone right into being a pilot. She was very, uh, very skilled. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and then Tessa, who teaches at the academy, at one point she says to Zot, 40% of my graduates this year who are trained as engineers or pilots have had to go into security. So, I mean, they're just like, they know there's this. So, but yeah, it was, it was called Marsco for a long time. Uh, Lorianne Downing, do you remember Lorianne Downing? One of our best students, she's a lawyer. Did, was Lorianne in your class? Do you remember that name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She read it for me because she was a PwC major, so she edited it at, at one point, and then we talked about the title, because I just called it Marsco, and then I was gonna say the dissident of Marsco, and she goes, you know, Marsco dissident would be better. So she gave it the name, so. And Trent Redfield was the one that, after, who's another grad, said, oh, I love that when you say the Marsco, it's a Marsco world, it's a Marsco world. And I thought, yeah, I'm just going to start the book with that. That's the first lines of the first book. It's a Marsco world. So, anyway, you had a question, right? I did, actually. It's kind of a long one, so I'm going to just going to do it. I got you. Speculative sci-fi, there's always sort of like a cognitive connection between the present and right. this future that we set in fictional work in. Yeah. Um, a lot of science fiction that involves humanity's exploration and expansion out into space, you know, colonies, things like that. Um, it kind of muddies the water between the dystopia and the utopia. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can't really pin it down one or the other. Do you think we're running out of space, not to, have a pun, uh, to tell utopian and dystopian stories as like we actually really start talking about in our reality, exploring space and building colonies? Well. Yeah, um, the U.S. better get on the stick. China said it wants a manned colony on the moon in 2020, you know. I think they could probably do it. I, I don't know. Um, since I lean so, so much on the politics, my gosh, this election cycle has given me more to talk about, not less. Uh, you know, uh, Alaska and Texas both are seriously talking about leaving the United States. And the whole premise of how Marsco takes over is countries fall apart and what they start to do is call disenfranchise and they just like the rich people just say guess what here's this poor area of, of whatever you're a new country you're not part of you know and so like all the states become their own independent and then they start subdividing and I'm reading the paper we were in LA and the Malibu school district you know big huge wealthy area wants to stop supporting the school the part of the Malibu school district is in a poor area and they want to stop supporting it <laughs> And they go, wow, that's right out of Marsco, you know. And then all you do is, you know, get your security people to keep them on their side of the fence and put little disc under their skin, which somebody's already suggested. So it's like, you know, it's not that far fetched. People are thinking of this stuff. So, but as far as the, I'm doing another series. Someday I'll do another series. That is 20 or 30 space, uh, solar systems, and it's a little bit like Star Trek, and they're, they zip there very quickly and blah blah blah. But it's about they, they're still ruled by an emperor and they really do want a democracy and so there's one faction and there's another faction that wants to replace the emperor with their guy who's just going to be a tougher emperor and, and uh, that's going to be a little bit lean toward what they call military science fiction because it's going to be a little, but it'll still be po political. I do a lot of political but yeah, I, I talked to Ken Murphy, our physicist who does the planetarium at school and I asked him about dark matter and dark space and he just said, Oh, invent it. He goes, I don't, we don't know anything about it. Whatever you say will probably be right. So, you know, I'm not going to, that's fun. Any other? Yeah, current news cycle talks about 80% uh, of humanity being superfluous in a relatively near future. There won't be jobs for 80% of humanity. Yeah. That sounds like cringe to me. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a. It, it, it's it's grim when you stop remembering that we're all human <laughs> and kind of linked, and we all deserve something. Yeah, like fresh water, clean water. You know, I mean, who could have imagined Flint if you wrote that ten years ago? And uh, and and that's pretty sin sinister because two of the whistleblowers ended up dead. I mean, so we're talking about serious cover-up and, you know, it's whatever. So, yeah, it's, it's doom and gloom. There's a hopeful ray at the end of book three. So I'll, I'll hold that out to you. So, any, anything else? Well, I, I'm, I'm willing to sign books or talk a little more if you have some questions. Thank you again for coming. This, uh, you're, you're a great crowd. Uh, if you haven't read book one, I hope we have book one and book two to sell. I hope you're um, interested in one or both of them and my lovely and talented assistant will take your money and I'll sign your book and we'll go from there. Thank you so much.